the trilobite, a primitive crustacean that could swim and crawl along the seafloor. Perhaps the first creature to have eyes. They looked out on a world crowded with organisms successfully adapted to life in the coastal shallows. As time went on, evolution increasingly favored the survival of those that could secrete a hard protective shell from the salts of the sea. Most of these early invertebrates have long since disappeared. But a few have survived to the present day, almost unchanged. This first known flowering of life was rich and varied, but like the lily of the sea, it blossomed rooted to the seabed, confined to shallow water. The challenge of the open sea was to be met by creatures of an entirely different order, the fish. Their remains first appear in rocks over 400 million years old. Like many of the invertebrates, these early fish were armored. The difference can be seen in the tail. They had a backbone, an internal skeleton that gave them a fluency of movement that was altogether new. Their descendants have dominated the seas ever since. But they also moved from the sea to fresh water, to lakes and rivers and shallow pools, and to hazards unknown in the sea. suffocation in a dried out pool. But where so many were overwhelmed, it seems that some held the secret of survival. And for one species in particular, seasonal drought acted as the spur to a momentous evolution. Eustonopteron, an air-breathing lungfish and the common ancestor of the higher animals. Here in its fins is the astonishing evidence of the evolutionary link. They stem from a lobe growing out from its body, a limb with bones articulated like fingers, strong enough to support its weight out of water. Eustonopteron could survive out of water only briefly. But now the pressures of environment began to exert their force to favor the survival of the most powerful lungs and the strongest limbs. And from Eustonopteron there evolved, in time, a new creature, the amphibian, securely adapted to life on the land. Meanwhile, a great chain of mountains had gradually surfaced along the eastern margin of the continent. And as the mountains grew, the sea that for so long had covered Appalachia retreated further inland. In its place, rivers now fingered their way into a vast swampland that stretched from Pennsylvania to Oklahoma. The swamps were a jungle of giant horse tails and ferns and tall trees with trunks checkered like snakeskin. In the shadows lurked the amphibians, living half in, half out of the water, much as alligators do today in the swamps of Louisiana.
The trees are very different now, but their cycle of growth and decay is the same. Leaves fall and branches slide into the stagnant water, building a tangled mat of debris that slowly sinks into the depths. From below, escaping methane signals the start of the forest's transformation. Coal, one of the continent's greatest reserves, an immense accumulation of energy locked in the fossil remains of the great forests that rose from the swamps in search of the sun 300 million years ago. million years ago and the long process of mountain building in the east was about to reach its climax with the birth of the Washita's and the Appalachians. The Appalachians so peaceful and still, it's difficult to believe they could ever have been any different. And yet, this land was once deep underwater. These rocks are the remains of a seabed the trilobites knew, raised high and then cut away by the river that flows below. Wherever rocks are exposed at the surface, they reveal the underlying structure of the landscape. But more than this, they give us a glimpse of its past. To see these violent upthrusts of naked rock is to sense the awesome power that raised this land from the depths of the sea and to realize that these majestic crags are merely relics of a grandeur that has long since passed away. The last crumbling remains of mountains that were once as high as the mightiest peaks of the Rockies. With the rise of the Appalachians, the essential character of the eastern states was firmly established. Southwestwards, however, the land was still unformed, much of it under the sea. And the way it now began to emerge was very different. West Temple of the Virgin at the entrance to Zion Park in Utah. A classic sequence of sedimentary rocks that show how the Southwest was built. At its base, the slopes are weathered and broken and their character is hard to read. But in places, the rock shows clearly thin layers of mudstone that reveal the last lingering influence of the sea. With each gentle creep of the tide, fresh silt was spread across the mud flats. Grain by grain, layer by layer, the foundations of the temple began to build.
tidal mudstone, 15 million years thick. With the foundations of the temple firmly laid, the sea at last withdrew. At Zion, the moment of its departure is clearly marked. What we see above the mudstone is a sudden change in the character of the rock. New forces had taken over the building of the temple. The rivers that had now begun to shape the new landscapes of the southwest spread their sediment over thousands of square miles. They must have been shallow and constantly changing their course. And it wasn't only sand and gravel they carried. Piled high on the middle slopes of the temple is the fallout from volcanic eruptions far to the west. Layers of ash stained with colorful minerals and rich in fossil remains. Trees uprooted by rivers in flood and buried in their ash-laden sediment. Nowhere have these logs been better preserved than in the petrified forest of Arizona. As the waterlogged trunks came into contact with the minerals in the soil, they were transformed, not just to common stone, but to amethyst, agate, and jasper. The petrified forest lies open now to the sky. But for millions of years, the logs lay deep under layers of sediment that have since worn away. At Zion, the overlying rocks are still there. A towering cliff, 2,000 feet of wind-blown sand. From the far Pacific, the sand blew inland for hundreds of miles for thousands of years. Over Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico, over Utah, and into Colorado, till the whole Southwest became one great desert. The shifting sands are still now, the petrified dunes weathered and worn, but the sweeping curves and fluted ridges of the wind-blown desert still echo in the stone, high on the slopes above Zion. The frozen dune fields mark the end of the sequence. Beneath their towering cliffs, the layers of sediment reach back 50 million years to the time they first rose from the sea. Rocks now shaped by time and the elements into the monumental landscapes of the American Southwest.
track of a dinosaur laid bare on the bed of a Texas river. And at Vernal in northeast Utah, a graveyard preserved as a monument to the creatures that dominated the earth for over a hundred million years. More than any other fossil remains, these massive bones have inspired in generations of scientists the urge to rediscover the past. Gradually, the picture has emerged and a world that seemed lost forever has been recovered from oblivion. At last, a creature had evolved that could raise its head from the mud and walk. An egg-laying reptile capable of leaving the narrow confines of the swamps and adapting to the boundless opportunities of the world that lay beyond. The dinosaurs. For sheer diversity and extravagance of form, there has never been anything like them. Surprising to discover that most of them were gentle creatures, harmless plant eaters whose fearsome appearance was purely defensive. But some were killers. The most powerful creatures that ever lived. The most powerful, and yet the last of their kind. With these magnificent creatures, the age of the great reptiles came swiftly to an end. Why? We may never know for certain. But one thing is sure. Theirs was an age of revolution in the restless history of the Earth. Their triumph was to survive for so long, over a hundred million years. 200 million years ago, when the dinosaurs were emerging from the swamps, the return of the Atlantic Ocean heralded the breakup of the supercontinent of Pangaea. North America was gradually separating from Africa and Europe to drift northwestwards across the Pacific. The birth of the modern continent had begun. Out in the Pacific, the convulsive birth of an island volcano as the floor of the ocean foundered under the pressure of the continent's westward drift. From Alaska to Mexico, the Earth's crust was heaving and warping, shearing and folding to relieve the awesome stresses of the continent's relentless advance. the tumultuous events that have shaped the face of North America, this was to be the climax, its final splendor, the creation of the Rocky Mountains. innermost depths, mountains that proclaim in every contorted line the violence of the forces that created them. The power to move mountains, an image in the mind of man since the dawn of history. But what we failed so long to understand was the element of time. 
From the moment those early tremors shook the western seaboard to the final heaving and thrusting that brought the Rockies to their peak took 170 million years. Now we understand and are filled all the more with wonder at the beauty of the ancient rocks that colored the maroon bells of Colorado and formed the stark enclosing walls of Alberta's Valley of the Seven Peaks and at the grandeur of granite, the thrusting pinnacles of the Tetons of Wyoming. As long as there are mountains, man will be drawn to them in search of beauty and peace of mind. And yet, as the shadows lengthen, imagination may lead him back through the arch of time to a vision of their creation, when the air was filled with the noisome rumblings of the earth and the violent surge and leap of molten rock. Even the most spectacular volcanic eruption is merely the surface display of a disturbance that reaches deep into the earth. As the molten magma rises from the depths, it may also be trapped below ground to blaze its way into the surrounding rock, shooting into clefts and fissures like shafts of lightning. In this way, the heavy elements from the Earth's interior were injected into its outer crust to bring within our reach its precious store of metals and rare minerals. that now reigns over the West may yet prove deceptive. Are the forces of volcanism dead or only dormant? High on the plateau of Yellowstone, the answer seems poised in the balance. How fragile it feels, this crust of earth that insulates us from the fires below how close we still are to that age of violent upheaval that created the Western Highlands and changed the face of the continent. Thirty-three million years ago, the Rockies had risen to their peak. The pressures of uplift at last overtaken by nature's opposing forces. The power of weather to attack and subdue the mountains and eventually bring them low. Heat and cold, wind and above all, water.
power of water to wear away rock and reshape a landscape. Nowhere is this more vividly shown than by the rivers that established their flow southwestwards from the Rockies. Here in the canyon lands are rivers that have sliced through the land to its very foundations, flowing through walls of rock over a billion years old. Yet until quite recent times, they flowed over the surface of a lowland plain. But then the land began to rise again, and their load of sediment started to grind its way deeper and deeper into the rock. The Grand Canyon of the Colorado the most spectacular creation of the destructive forces of erosion. Long before the cutting of the canyon lands, the modern drainage pattern of the continent had begun to take shape. To the east of the Rockies, the continuous outwash of sediment built the high plains and spread over the central lowlands. And as rivers from east and west came together to flow into the Gulf of Mexico, there began to form a great delta. As the delta grew, the coastline was extended by an immense accumulation of silt and sand, porous rock that was to reap a strange and fabulous harvest from the sea. Offshore, as always, the constant rain of silt and organic debris, microscopic grains of pollen from the land, and from the sea itself, the minute bodies of dying foraminifera and diatoms, falling to the depths along with clumps of algal weed falling through the darkness to their burial ground. Layer piles upon layer and sinks into the depths till the debris is sealed under an immense weight of sediment. And now the heat and pressure of the earth perform their curious chemistry, transforming plant and animal life into oil and gas. Once formed, the petroleum, under pressure, seeks its escape, rising through cracks in the enclosing rocks till it meets a layer of porous stone. Following the line of the rock layer, its journey may lead it far from its source. In this way, oil and gas came to rest in the delta sands of Texas and Louisiana and in similar reservoirs throughout the continent. Trapped below ground by impenetrable rock till the day their energy and power would be discovered. Meanwhile, the continuing course of life's evolution had subtly changed the appearance of the land and radically altered the forms of life it supported. With the extinction of the dinosaurs, the mammals had evolved with astonishing speed as the dominant order of the animal kingdom. The gulf that separates us from the past was narrowing life was gradually coming closer to the forms we know today. Yet even as late as five million years ago, North America teemed with exotic life creatures that would seem more at home in Africa than on the plains of Kansas or Wyoming.
the gap between past and present had narrowed, but not yet closed. One million years ago, the balance of the seasons began to change. The grip of winter tightened year by year till the land lay shrouded deep in ice and snow. A blanket of ice 10,000 feet thick. Four times it advanced over the continent, scouring the surface of the lowlands and carving the imprint of its passing high among the mountains. Then, as the ice at last retreated and its pent-up waters drained back to the sea, there lay revealed in every feature the land we know so well. A land ready and waiting. High on the rolling uplands of Wyoming, the desert sands drift out towards a distant sea of grass and lead us to a final encounter with the past, just 10,000 years ago. The sun-bleached remains of a bison. Between its bones, a spearhead. Man had arrived to take up his inheritance. <laughs>